Well, we want y'all to get to know us a little bit today. And so I am Kimberly Woodhouse. And we're going to share a little bit. Watch my water take a nosedive. That'll be great. <laughs> Maybe I should just carry it. Um, <laughs> I almost died this past year, so I drank 160 ounces of water a day. So if I'm guzzling, just, you know, think happy thoughts <laughs> while I'm drinking. Um, she read our cute little quote. I had to throw that up there because Tracy and I are really good friends, and we have a lot of fun with chocolate and research and writing. Um, this is my family. Aren't they cute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my husband, we've been married 26 years now. That's our son on the right. His name is Josh. He just turned, no, he's going to turn 23. And he got married this last year in August, which makes me a mother-in-law. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? I'm not quite used to it yet, but I keep thinking one of these days I'm going to get used to being a mother-in-law. Call the mother-in-law. Everybody asks me, what's it like to be a mother-in-law? Well, gosh, I don't even really know. And we just moved to Michigan two weeks ago. So I tell everybody that I left my brain somewhere between Colorado and Michigan. I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> so this picture is my favorite of the family pictures. That same day we were taking pictures, the photographer was out there. And if you notice, my husband and I are really cracking up laughing in this picture. My husband never smiles this big for a picture. And you want to know why? That's not our dog. <laughs> That is the neighbor's dog that came over, sat on my foot, mind you. He's sitting on my foot in that picture and posed for the camera. So you had to see that. Yes, we got photobombed by the neighbor's dog. His name was Tebow. And uh, <laughs> just cracked me up. So that is not our dog, but those are my chickens. Now, years ago, I did a big women's thing at this little bitty town. Um, up in Nebraska, and the town had 250 people. And for this Christmas event, they had more than 250 women come to this. They obviously knew how to do an event. I don't even know where the people came from because <laughs> it was in the middle of nowhere. But at the book table, we had this big long line, and I'm signing books, and a lady comes up and she goes, would you take a chicken for a book? <laughs> and I'm busy signing books, and I really wasn't paying attention. Once you know that lady came back and she had a live chicken in a box. <laughs> And I drove that chicken back from Nebraska to Colorado in my car and got added to the number of chickens that we had there in Colorado. We had them named, and oh my goodness, we had crazy names for our chickens. I'm a writer. If I'm staring at you, I'm not being rude. I'm trying to decide if you need to go in a book. And if you're a snot, I may be trying to decide how to kill you. <laughs> so my children got me a shirt that says, do not annoy this best-selling author, or she may put you in a book and kill you. <laughs> And then another one that says, you're dangerously close to being killed off in my next novel. <laughs> so <laughs> my husband likes to joke that I like to kill people in books. That's really not my job, <laughs> is it? No. <laughs> we um, enjoy it. Um, I think I just turned in, i got to add them up now. I never thought I'd lose count, but I think I just turned in book 18. And I still feel like I'm, I'm starting. Still feel like I'm the little peon here. Especially when, you know, she's on book 115. Um, <laughs> when we did a tour for All Things Hidden, our first book together, it was a lot of fun because this little old lady came up to the table and she goes, well, honey, how many books have you written? And I said, nine. I was very proud of the fact I'd written nine books. And she goes over to Tracy, well, how many books have you written? And she said, 99. <laughs> so my ninth book was her 99th. Um, our book together was a lot of fun. Um, Tracy and I have been dear friends for a long time for... 20 plus years, and it's just grown, and she's precious to me. She has mentored me and guided me and been a huge influence in my life. She is my favorite author, so when people ask me who my favorite author is, in fact, when I found out who she was, I was working with an editor. I was like, Tracy Peterson, she's my most favorite author ever. I did the whole fangirl thing, and I still do it now. There's Tracy Peterson. Um, <laughs> I'm traveling with you. No. Um, we have a hoot together, if you can't tell. I am from South Louisiana, so my twang really comes out when I come down south and I'm really tired. So, and again, like I said, my brain is somewhere between Colorado and Michigan, and I have, you know, no idea where it went. But All Things Hidden takes place in 1935, the of colonization. Beyond the Silence is in 1891, California. And then In the Shadow Denali is the first in the series, the Heart of Alaska series, and that starts in 1917 in Curry, Alaska, and Out of the Ashes, which just released in 1923. 
we are really excited about these books. But just so you know a little bit about me, this is my verse, why we do what we do. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That's from Colossians 3, 17. So we just want to be up front with you about this, especially when we do events at libraries, that we are Christian authors. And this is why we do what we do. We hope that does not offend anybody, but up front you need to know that. Because if you don't agree with that, you're probably not going to like our books a whole lot. But we pray you still read them anyway. Research and why it's important. We talk about research a lot. We research a ton, and we love research. We love doing research trips together, which we've done many, and um, we end up laughing probably more than we do anything else, but we have a blast. It's really important, for instance, to know that in the little town of North Pole, Alaska, there actually is a North Pole. And there's a story behind it, that's what the little plaque talks about, was because in 1951 they made two of them and one of them was dropped out of the back of an airplane at exact North Pole and then the other one got lost along the way and they found it in a junkyard and so they put it as a monument in North Pole, Alaska. I wrote a couple of books that took place in North Pole, No Safe Haven and Race Against Time, and I wrote those with my daughter and it was really important for us to know about North Pole because if you notice even the library sign is a candy cane. If you don't know about North Pole, you don't realize that the entire town is decorated for Christmas year-round. In fact, even the handicapped parking spaces <laughs> are Santa Claus. Just so that you know, <laughs> this little post office right here in North Pole, Alaska, this is a cool fact. All of the mail in the world that is written to Santa Claus, North Pole, goes to this post office right here. And those lovely people take care of Santa Claus's mail, just so you know that. Another really important thing to talk about is um, these mountains. I've used um, a lot of books of mine take place in Alaska. And Denali is the highest, tallest mountain in North America at 20,320 feet. And a lot of people might think that his name was Mount McKinley. But that was not his original name. His name was Denali. And a few years ago, he got back to his original name, Denali. If you go to Alaska and you say Mount McKinley, they're going to know you're a tourist. <laughs> Just so you know, we lived in Alaska a long time. And he is a he. He is the great one, the high one. The mountain on the left, in the same little chain, is Sultana. And that means the wife. And she's over 17,000 feet tall. And then the little one in the middle, <laughs> the little one in the middle, is called Baguya, and he's over 14,000 feet, and that means the child, which I think is very interesting. And when we lived in Colorado, I thought it was hysterical because everybody wanted to talk about climbing a 14er and how ooh, big and massive that was, and the 14er and this one's the baby. Pretty cute, huh? If you want to do anything with Denali National Park, it's really important that you get information from the right sources. Talkeetna Ranger Station in this little bitty town off the Talkeetna Spur, off of the Parks Highway, is a fabulous place, and the rangers helped me a lot. I told a story um, about another book that I wrote, um, Denali Dreams, and it's four short stories in one. They're called novellas, and I wrote it with Ronnie Kendig. She wrote two, and I wrote two. And when we w went back and talked to the rangers, when Tracy and I were up there, Missy, the ranger who helped me all the time, she came up to me, she goes, I'll tell you a story. I said, okay, what? And she said, I want you to know that the rangers took your book up to base camp and to high camp because the rangers stay on the mountain at base camp, which is at 10,000 feet, and high camp is at 17,000 feet. And they trade back and forth to help all the climbers because there's so many climbers. Well, they took it, and they were reading out it out loud over the radio to each other trying to figure out who was who, who was what character in the book. <laughs> they thought that she had given them all kinds of secrets, you know, about them that I put in the book. Anyway, I thought that was really funny. But the things that we learn as we're doing research, this is a reason why I will never climb Denali. Are you ready? Anybody know what that is? <laughs> there you go. See, you're so smart. I love it when people know. It's called a clean mountain can <laughs> because in Denali National Park, you are not allowed to leave anything behind nothing behind. So that's your toilet. And if you climb the mountain, you get to climb up the mountain and down the mountain with your toilet. I think that's great fun, but no, thank you. I don't think I will be climbing the mountain. 
especially when they talked about the apparatus that it took for women to be, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> not going to happen. But another interesting thing, just to give you perspective here, I like to show this picture because these are both of Denali. In this one, Denali is on the right with Sultana and Boguya, right? This is Denali. This is still about 100 miles away from the actual mountain, okay? That's how massive he is. Two of my editors um, from another project, they went up to Alaska with me on some research, and I wanted you to get the perspective of seeing the people and the mountain in the background and knowing that it's still 100 miles away. That's pretty impressive. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, there's a lot of sacrifices that we make for you, our readers. They're really huge and big, and I hope you understand what we go through for you. <laughs> yeah. This is croissant French toast in North Pole, Alaska. This little place had been on diner, diners, drive-ins, and dives as well, which was amazing. We found it, a little hole in the wall. Absolutely terrible. You don't want it. <laughs> it was probably one of the best things I've ever eaten in my life. It was really, really good. And this is called a crabby omelet. Isn't that fun? That's from Snow City Cafe in Alaska in downtown Anchorage. And I actually use that in the book No Safe Haven because he brings her a crabby omelet because she's crabby, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. But we just want you to know that we could not do this without you. And so we love to meet our readers. Um, obviously, we do this a lot. We go around the country, and we love to meet you and talk to you. And we don't care how many people there are. We just love to be able to meet with you and talk with you. And even if we come to one place, and if, if it's for one person, you know, God uses us in just one person's life at a time as you're reading the book. And so we love to meet you. We're not too big for our britches or anything like that. Just want to make sure that you know that ahead of time. We also have absolutely no fun together as portrayed in the pictures. She loves to make fun of me, and um, I tease her right back. <laughs> so <laughs> she is amazing because she is the Tracy Peterson. In one bookstore one time, I went to the bathroom in the back, and she was at the front. I was like, did you know that the Tracy Peterson is here? <laughs> Yelled it really loud so everybody, you know, get excited. <laughs> Go to the front, buy a book. <laughs> All Things Hidden, 1935, The Matanooks of Colonization. This is a fascinating piece of our country's history because we were going through a horrible depression. There was a massive drought in the North and in the Midwest. People were dying. They'd lost their homes. There was no food. FDR sent 203 families up to colonize the Matanuska Valley in Alaska. Now, you go to Alaska today, <laughs> and it can be pretty harsh, okay? Think about going back then when they didn't have roads and they didn't have anything. They had to chop down all the trees. They had to do everything and build their own settlements before winter set in. Most of them lived in tents until December. Not all the homes were finished until December, and that's the insides weren't finished. That was just the, the frames of the homes that were put together. So this is at the Historical Society and the museum that's up there, and we spent a lot of time with them before we wrote the book, while we were writing the book, and after we wrote the book, and then when we were on tour in Alaska a few years ago, the Palmer Historical Society invited us to come and share because they were so impressed about the historical accuracy in the book that they wanted us to share with people because it's a big deal up there. A lot of these people are descendants of the colonists. And a fascinating fact, the people got to only take 2,000 pounds a piece. Now, I just want you all to know I just moved with huge moving trucks. And I don't even think, just my office books alone, I think are more than 2,000 pounds. <laughs> we had a lot of weight. And uh, that piano, somebody brought that up, this beautiful, ornate, old, upright, extremely heavy piano. This is one that was brought up, and I got to play it when we were up there. It was absolutely beautiful. Beyond the Silence, as I was saying, takes place in Angels Camp, California, a really neat little area in California. And we had them. Um, the hero in the book grows olives. He has an olive farm. So we did a whole lot of research about olive farming, which was incredible. We also had the little boy be mute in the book, his son, because the mother had died. 
I don't want to give away the whole story. It's called Beyond the Silence, you'll understand. But we get readers' letters all the time about our character named Harry, which everybody loves Harry in Beyond the Silence. He's a special character that plays a big part in the book. And um, this is olive trees that are in Angel's Camp. Aren't they beautiful? The olive groves. And this was the Angel's Hotel from that same era that still stands today. And then this is your assignment. You didn't know you were coming to get homework, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to check out Mark Twain's first story, the very first story, okay? The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. So like she said earlier in another library, just look up Mark Twain and Jumping Frog and you'll find it. Famous story, put this place on the map and guess what? Now they have a huge Jumping Frog Festival every year in Angel's Camp. And apparently this frog in 1985, Mellow Hopper was his name, jumped 20 feet and eight and a half inches. <laughs> so instead of the walk of stars like they have in Hollywood, they have the walk of frogs. I think everybody needs to go see that. That would be fascinating. Well, on to the Curry Hotel, this series, The Heart of Alaska. What is so fascinating here about Curry, Alaska, is it does not exist anymore because it burned down and because it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was the heart of Alaska at the time because the only way to get anywhere in Alaska was by the train. And the train went from Seward to Fairbanks, and Curry was exactly halfway. So since those big steam-powered engines at the time had to stop, this was their first stay, and they stayed there before they could go the rest of the way. The president even stayed at this hotel as he came in in 1923 and drove the Golden Spike in to finish the Alaska Highway, or the Alaska Railroad, which was so fascinating. So Alaska had very few people other than the native people um, for a long time. And you know, a lot of people think that Alaska cities are quite large and they were large back then. Anchorage was a camp. There wasn't even hardly anything in Anchorage. Um, if you notice, as I talked about um, 1935, the Matanuska Valley, that was much later than this before even all of those people came. So the rich and the wealthy would take the train because you know they were bored. It was the thing to do, you know, to ever go see Alaska, you know. Um, Denali National Park was a national park, but there were no roads into it yet. There was one man in charge of the entire national park who was the superintendent, and his name was Harry Karstens. He had to run the whole thing and build roads into it, and yet the whole national park is bigger than a lot of the states down here. That's how large it is. Um, but still, they built this hotel because there had to be a stop-off point because the trains had to stop. They spent the night overnight. They had water and electricity. Some of the rooms even had their own bathrooms, and they had this elaborate kitchen and dining hall. So during this era, it was the heart of Alaska, and it was absolutely beautiful. If you look right here, this suspension bridge went across the Susitna River, <laughs> and then they would climb this ridge and hike for five miles to get to the top of Curry Ridge to be able to see one of the most fabulous views of Denali in all the world. Um, this is the inside of the lobby. The, look at these beautiful leather chairs. They had gorgeous, shiny, polished wood, lush red carpets. It was absolutely gorgeous inside this hotel. But this cracks me up because I'm like, how many of us would stay in a hotel nowadays when the train was right there? <laughs> But this one, you got off the train, you stepped onto the, <laughs> the platform, you walked into the hotel. There you go. It's right there. But this is the Regal Vista lookout on Curry Ridge. Remember how I told you that they walked five miles to get there? This is still there. It's extremely hard to get to. Um, they are in, I think, about to start the South Denali Viewpoint Park entrance which for years they've had it on the map they've been trying to decide if they're going to do it but because this is what we call in the bush it's very remote off of the parks highway if they build that center then they're going to build a hiking trail that will take you to this historic spot because it's still there it has been fixed up by several groups one was a skiing group that went up there and skied all the way up there to be able to um, you know reinforce it make sure that it was good you can see the wires and the cables coming off of it in this picture when it had been reinforced to sustain the winds that were on top of the ridge. But it's so important because it's such a huge piece of Alaska's history and then this was the view. Wow. You cannot get this view in hardly anywhere in Alaska to be able to see Denali and it's absolutely gorgeous and so they would climb up the hill. Curry was known for this fabulous little place. 
historic lookout still there. Um, this series is named in loving memory of Cassidy Faith Hale. She was in our youth group in our church and she was hit by a truck a few years ago at 15 years old and killed. And so the heroine in the, in, in the Shadow of Denali is named after Cassidy, Cassidy Faith, and has a lot of her characteristics. My favorite story is from VBS, and she was helping out. She and my daughter would get, were good friends, and they were both a little klutzy. You know how teenagers sometimes they are. You're all limbs at points. And she was just running with her little preschoolers and just tripped and fell over nothing. You know, there was nothing in the floor. She just fell face first, and she got up, and she goes, well... I guess the floor needed a hug. <laughs> so if you haven't read In the Shadow of Denali yet, you need to watch for that story in the book because I used it for Cassidy in the book. Tracy taught me on the last few tours that it was really important to share with you guys our reader letters because we get tons of reader letters. And I want to challenge you, not you don't have to write us, but if you read a book that really touches you, the author has a website contact them through their website. Please let them know what that book has done in your life. They love to hear it. We love to hear it. We love to have the encouragement and to see how God has used his story through us to touch lives because that's what it's all about. Um, this first one, I was at the end of my rope or so I thought when I picked up Denali Dreams. Your first story with Karen touched me in a way I never thought a fiction book could reach a person. The rope analogy you used in the story was exactly what I needed to hear at the time. Thank you for pointing me back in the right direction and letting your gift of stories lift up the world. That was from MK. Then the second one says, my life has been a wreck and after reading Out of the Ashes, this just released, um, I've decided to turn things around because it was my attitude that was a wreck. I think that's just the greatest quote ever. <laughs> I've let so many things get in the way and I've played the blame game for far too long. After reading your latest book, I went to your website. I got lost in time reading a lot of your blogs and then picked up your home book about your story from the library. <laughs> when I read all you've been through and that you almost died last year, a big thought hit me between the eyes. You always focus on joy and on encouraging others rather than sitting and whining. <laughs> I'm changing my thoughts and it's thanks to God and you for being willing to be honest with us through your stories. Thank you for taking time to read my note and please keep doing what you're doing. I'll never be the same. Jim C. That was from a man. We do have a lot of male readers, a lot of men. Um, Out of the Ashes is a very dear book to us because we both came out of the ashes last year. We had a lot of really tough things. Like I told you at the beginning, I almost died last year. And the fascinating part is that I was writing the rough draft when all of this <laughs> happened. And then Tracy lost her nephew a few weeks later through a, just a really horrible, tough time for their family as well. And then when the edits came, it seemed like we had grown so much and the Lord had done so much in our lives that the book really grew out of the ashes from that. And it's a great story because, as you all know, we're not perfect and we all go through junk. And I think it's really important for us to portray what it's really like, what we live through. And our characters both came from some tough places, but there was still hope, there was still forgiveness, and there was still love. And so that's what we love about the story out of the ashes. Um, like I said, this lady next to me, I really don't think she needs much of an introduction, but I like to introduce her because she's amazing. <laughs> she is on book 115 or something like that, maybe even more. Um, like I said, she's mentored me. She's mentored probably a lot of people. She helped start ACFW um, almost 20 years ago. That's American Christian Fiction Writers. And... She is just a joy, and so it is a privilege to be able to write with her. It's a privilege to call her my friend, and it's a privilege to introduce to you Tracy Peterson. Oops. I love you. I love you too. I hope you appreciate this lady too. She's amazing. Where she likes to walk around, I like to hug the podium, so. <laughs> <laughs> Kim is phenomenal. She didn't tell you this, but she is a gourmet cook. <laughs> she homeschooled her children to college level. She is a classically trained musician and can sing every bit as beautifully as Sandy Patty and plays piano like nobody. She's amazing. <laughs> and I've always appreciated her encouragement too, so I hope you give her a hand of, uh, <laughs> of appreciation there. 
This is the first thing you need to know about me. Hmm. And yet another day has passed, and I did not use algebra once. Very interesting. <laughs> Testify. <laughs> I do not like math. I'm a word person. I told my ninth grade algebra teacher, I don't like this. I'm never going to use it again. What little college I have, one of those classes, was algebra, <laughs> because we were homeschooling our daughter, and she was a genius level IQ, fourth grader, and had to have algebra. The other thing you need to know about me is I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And like Kim said earlier, I tell everybody when I go to speak this, because if you don't like that, you're not going to like my books. You're not going to like what I have to say, because Jesus is the foundation of what I do, why I do it. This is my wonderful husband, Jim. I did not bring pictures of my children because they don't like to be on screen. But <laughs> Jim is a historian, and years and years and years ago, we married, about 38 of them, and uh, found out that we had this in common. Jim taught me a lot about history. Uh, he wanted to curate a museum, and I needed him more, so I hired him to work full-time for me. But uh, he's a dear, dear person, couldn't come with us on this trip, but so oftentimes he does travel with me to carry the books, you know. <laughs> These are my beautiful grandchildren, the ones over there are my middle child, my daughter, gave me those three beautiful grandchildren. And these lovely children over here are adopted. Uh, my oldest daughter lives in Boston. She is the one that has the genius IQ. She went for seven years, uh, seven months, sorry, seemed like years to mama, <laughs> uh, seven months missions work in Uganda. And while she was there, she met a beautiful young man named Jean-Pierre who was studying to become a minister. He and his wife, Albine, had these beautiful five daughters, and they wanted so desperately for their son because in African society, in Burundi, if you do not have a son, you are not a man. And when Jean-Pierre's mother and father passed away, uh, his father was killed by gorillas, and we had already become friends, and he asked my husband and I if we would be his parents. And our pastor told us, he doesn't ask this lightly, this is not just one of those flippant kind of things. If you say yes, this is a commitment for life, just like to your children, just like if you went to court. And so we did tell him yes after we prayed about it. We thought, you know, we love this young man and his family. And so as the years went by then, they had this lovely little girl. Her name's Tracy, after me. And this little girl's named Ruth, after my mother, Janine Ruth. And they finally got their boy, <laughs> this sassy little kid. And, oh, man. Some of the pictures they've sent me, I just want to, I just want to squirrel him away and take him home. But they are all very precious to me, and they always inspire me. This is where I live, just down the road anyway. It's not my house, but uh, we have this beautiful Montana mountain range. We have mountains all around us. Have a lot of snow. I wanted to apologize because it seems like every time I come south, y'all get a snowstorm or ice or whatever. Kim was saying how her, her twang comes back out from having been raised in the South. I lived only two years in Dallas and I do it. I get down here with you and pretty soon I call home and my husband says, you've been there too long, come home. <laughs> and this is my office. A lot of times readers will ask me, where do you work? What do you do? You know, how do you do it? So this is my office. I sit in here most every day. And a lot of times readers want to know what I do for hobbies. Because I believe strongly in hands-on learning for my books, I learned to spin on a spinning wheel. Found out I really liked it. <laughs> and so for, for relaxation, I often spin. Um, and not the bicycle kind, you know. <laughs> and I love to quilt. And then I read. I read all the time. And reading is a passion of mine, has been since I was a child. I love libraries, and my heartfelt thanks to all libraries everywhere, because libraries made me what I am. My mother gave me a piece of paper and a pencil in, in church to keep me quiet, and I credit her with storytelling. She drew that out in me, because she'd tell me, write me a story. And then afterwards, she'd say, tell me your story. And that was brilliant, because then I had her undivided attention. And so for 15 minutes, 20, however long I could stretch it, I would tell her a story. So stories, books, all of this is my passion. 
These are some of the titles I've written and they represent a variety of things I've done in my life. Kim and I like to travel to the places we write about. We talk to the people that experience some of the things that our people experience or that they are experts in that area. And so we have a, just a lot of fun. I have written everything from medieval to contemporary books. I've even had a couple of nonfiction. Some girls watched Beauty and the Beast and wa wanted the prince. I wanted the library. You know, it's so true. I, I love books. It's my passion. I just got rid of a bunch of books. I think I, I was trying to remember how many. I think I got rid of about 300 books. And I still, it looks like they never went. My, my shelves are full. I'm not addicted to reading. I can quit as soon as I finish one more chapter. <laughs> This is my latest series. This was the series that came out last year, and thanks to you readers, it did very well. And it is set uh, in the 1840s, Whitman Mission in Walla Walla, Washington. People went west on the Oregon Trail, as you know, and then they ended up here in the Walla Walla area, oftentimes when their wagons broke down, when they were sick. In this case, there was a horrible measles epidemic. And so I put my characters into that situation because I knew that in November then of 1847, the Whitman mission was going to be attacked by the Cayuse Indians and uh, all the men were killed. And Narcissa Whitman, uh, Dr. Marcus Whitman's wife, was the only female that was killed. But then the women and children were taken hostage for a month and I thought, how very interesting for a book. So this, these are pictures of the area where the Whitman mission was, looking down here from this hill where they actually uh, have a monument to those who were killed. That whole area down there is where the Whitman mission was. And again, this was the lower, just a, a grounds view of it. This is a uh, Cayuse Brave, and uh, I brought that just to show the, the costumes, uh, kind of clothes that they would have worn. But we go to the places that we write about so that we can learn as much as possible. I want my books to do three things. I want them first, I call it my three E's. I want them to entertain you. I love nothing more than when somebody writes me a letter and says, I couldn't sleep, I had to finish this book. You know, my aunt will tell her, tell my cousins that until the new book is read, they get no hot food and no clean clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so I want the book to entertain you. I want you to have fun with it. But I want to educate you also. And so I work very hard to try to be as historically accurate as possible. And I've actually won awards for that. And, and so I try my darndest to be right. However, I make mistakes. And when I do, you lovely readers love to tell me. <laughs> and I don't mind at all. So you send those letters and I'll try to make changes. In book two of that same series, it takes place in Oregon City, which is just outside of Portland, if you're familiar with that area at all. So that's basically how the city looked at the time of my book. And this is Willamette Falls. Can't see much of the falls, but down at the bottom, they actually had a jail because it was very difficult for anybody to get into or escape from. <laughs> and so during the story, you'll read about the various Cayuse men who were taken into uh, the jail there to await trial. And I thought that was kind of interesting the way that sat there at the end of the falls. Mm -hmm. The third book in that series, Cherished Mercy, takes place on the, along the Rogue River in southwest Oregon. I kind of wanted to do a full circle thing. When the Indians attacked the Whitman mission and annihilated the men and held the women and children hostage, it really changed the government's outlook on how to handle the Native American situation. And they became very hostile towards the Indians and created what I call a full-on annihilation program and it became an extermination rather than dealing with them or trying to find a peace. And so I wanted to go down here because the Rogue River Indian Wars were a lot of them uh, begun by the whites and they attacked. And I wanted to show, you know, problems with race and, and problems with the ugly hatred over things you don't understand and the people and cultures you don't understand. Nothing new. We had it with us way back. So I got to suffer for you and take a jet ride down the river. <laughs> and the Rogue River area back into the interior is still very unspoiled and beautiful. And so it worked well to try to imagine that for my story. This is how the 
Indians in the area. There were about 15 different tribes that were considered Rogue River Indians. And this tribe, uh, a lot of them lived like this with the house half underground, half above ground. They are actually Athabascan, and which is in Alaska, but they had uh, migrated down. And so their background in history though, you'll find a lot of their cultural, um, the things they eat, the things they wear, are very similar to the Athabascans in Alaska. Can I ask a question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> you read the book. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> they would actually have to kind of crawl in and then climb down to get into the house. Yeah. And what she's saying, they they had to make a vent for the the fire. They would just have the fire right on the dirt floor. And of course, out of the ashes, Kim and I have have done our best to study and and make sure that we get. All the details for Alaska, we go there just for you. Uh, <laughs> we will go back and we will go to Nome this time. But uh, we have had so much fun. These are some of our sufferings. Death by chocolate there. <laughs> that was a real suffering for you there. <laughs> just beautiful, beautiful land though. And uh, you know, we try even to the point of this is a time schedule mm -hmm. of the trains that went in and out of Curry. We try to be as accurate as possible. We go back and check weather. We try to make it as accurate as we can. We look at old almanacs, read diary accounts. Mm -hmm. Here's some more suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Kim is a, uh, she should be a spokesperson for Chewy's. Uh, <laughs> this is Chewy's uh, Mex Tex-Mex food. Before oh. we came on this trip, I printed her out a list of all the Chewy restaurants that would be on the, the route so that we could go she put it in a card for me. I did, I did. <laughs> but we have a lot of fun, we really do. This, I <laughs> wasn't going to share with you, but Kim said I had to. In my desires to be as accurate as possible, I oftentimes experience things that my characters experience. So I decided in one of my books that my character needed to drive a stagecoach. And I thought, okay, I need to learn how to drive a stagecoach. It's that simple. My girlfriend said, well, my brother has a uh, tourist business and he drives stagecoaches. He'll teach you how to drive a stagecoach. I said, great. He invited us to come on out. Now, the first thing I did not realize, the stagecoaches were so very tall and that the wheels would hit me right about here. <laughs> we're still there is no escalator or stairs that go <laughs> up to the seat where you have to drive. So I wasn't sure how this was going to work out because I'm not the athletic type. And the driver, his name's BJ, he looks down at me, he says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to climb up on the hub and then you're going to climb up on top of the wheel. He said, but don't stay there when you get there because if the horses move, the wheel moves and you will move. <laughs> He says, then you're going to hook your foot over here, you're going to grab up here, and you're going to hoist yourself into the boot and then up on the seat, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> and I'm going, uh-huh. <laughs> so I took a running jump at the hub. As you can see, I got there, and I got there with very little trauma. So I thought, hey, this isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> but then I had to get up, whoops, up on the top of the wheel. The wheel's right up against me. There's no run and jump. There's <laughs> nothing there that I can do but fight and battle to get up on top of that wheel. So I did, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked. And this is not when I was working on it by myself. This is an afterthought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I worked myself silly, and I finally got up there, and I was so proud. But I was exhausted, and I was ready to make base camp. <laughs> I'm going to stop here for a while, but that's where I'm not supposed to stop. And the horses started to back up. And the wheel started to move, and I, s I went right off the edge. Almost got my foot run over. So I thought, well, that's the end of my stagecoach driving career. You know, there's, it's just a very good reason why overweight middle-aged women did not drive stagecoaches in the Old West. <laughs> I'm here to testify. So along came this little gal. She is actually the niece. And she says, come on, I'm going to help you. I'm going, uh-huh. 
I mean, she probably weighed 100 pounds dripping wet. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> she says, come on. And so she says, I'm going to push. And the driver reaches down. He says, I'm going to pull. <laughs> I said, I'm going to pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, please. But push, pull, pray. I got up there. <laughs> I made it up there and I learned to drive a stagecoach. And the thing that came to mind as I was doing this, I thought, you know, in the 1870s, women wore a lot of clothes. And especially a properly dressed woman, a lady who was traveling, would wear a lot of clothes because you didn't want to look too feminine and you wanted to be covered up completely. So you had bloomers and drawers and petticoats and you had underskirts and overskirts and corsets and corset covers and you had an underblouse and an overblouse and you had gloves and hat and coat and skirt and boots and hat and so by the time you got done you could have anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds of clothing <laughs> and that is no joke so I thought well that's great I am going to use my overweightness to put into my character's life <laughs> of why she struggled to drive this stagecoach. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun. I do things like that. I'll sit in barns in minus 30 degree weather to help with calf, calving. Uh, I have learned to, like I said, uh, use a spinning wheel. I'm now writing a series on uh, Wild West shows. And I've been talking a lot to trick writers. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> I just don't think that's probably wise. <laughs> but I am going to go see some here in a couple of weeks and watch as they instruct others. This is going to be my next book. It comes out in March. And it is called the Golden Gate Secrets series. But each of the covers has a lovely, gorgeous woman with this voluptuous hat. So <laughs> I'm, we've been calling it the Big Hat series. <laughs> Set in San Francisco in 1905 to 1907, I wanted to touch on the earthquake that took place in 1906 and the horrible fires that took place afterwards. A lot of people don't realize it, but it was the fires that were so very destructive, not the earthquake. Uh, people uh, also, a lot of people died because the, fire, uh, the earthquake was at 5.14 in the morning. They thought they were okay. They looked their house over. Everything looked all right. They went back to bed. And they died in their sleep because the gas mains had busted. Mm. And a lot of people just asphyxiated. <coughs> the fires raged for four days and afterwards, this was what was left. And it was just devastating. It took most of downtown and spread out uh, to the dock areas and whatnot. And so I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about the corruption of the town and uh, the recovery. When we do research, as I said, we really try to get into the details. Uh, this is taken from a newspaper at the time. We get in there and we look at the houses of the time period. We look at the clothes and the, the styles, the fashions, and why they wore what they wore so that we can be as accurate as possible. A lot of times, those things really do affect what your characters can and can't do. So for me, one of my verses that guides and, and really has inspired me is from Romans 15, 4, and it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scripture and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And hope is really what it's all about. The third thing I want my books to do is encourage. I get letters just like Kim, and I told her, I said, it's so important to remember these readers. This is a ministry for me. It always has been. Mm -hmm. And so when the, writer, when the readers send in notes of encouragement, that means so much. And when they send in notes to tell me how the books have touched their lives, that, that's even more important to me. This letter came from a woman, and she said, I wanted to let you know that your books have been an inspiration to me. I left a religious cult 10 years ago and was very confused about a great many things. I loved God, but I didn't know the truth about him. I didn't even know Christian fiction existed. I just happened upon your books at the library. Thank you, library. Reading fiction was an escape from a trying reality, but your books were a link for me to an alternative view and a deeper understanding of God and people who related to him in an entirely different way than what I was used to. It gave me a little push in a good direction. God has worked very powerfully in my life, and he used you in that journey. And then thank you so much for writing Brides of Alaska. It has been the best book I have ever read. Why? because I found myself in those characters. I found a newness of faith 
and courage to reach beyond my comfort zone because of the scriptures coming alive within the stories and the people involved. It was real. It touched my soul. <clears throat> I even cried with inner joy, feeling my relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Yes, men can feel that <laughs> deep relationship too. If you have another book I should read, please email me the name. <laughs> I will read it. Again, thank you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. So which book out of the hundred or so that you wrote did you recommend for him? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a question I was not prepared for. <laughs> <laughs> Probably one of the Alaska series, I would imagine. We try to have a good balance of male-female action as far as, you know, characters learning mm -hmm. and growing, so... Yeah. That is the Heart of the Frontier series, mm -hmm. and that was the one with the uh, mission, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Marcus Whitman mission yep. that was attacked, yes. Was Treasured Grace. Yeah. Grace. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Last but not least, oops, I went right past. Where did I go? Uh, I don't know. Well, oh. I was going to share with you one last thought, but that's quite all right. I think I just... Uh, Down at the bottom? I have to go all the way through everything. It's a reminder. It's a refresher course. Pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to take questions from you guys, yes. too. And so if you have questions about why we do what we do, what we're coming up with and doing next, all those things, or anything else, anything but math, <laughs> I will answer. Okay, my last verse is from Colossians 2, 2 and 3. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. So if you have questions, we're happy to answer. I have one. Just a second. She, she held her hand up first. <laughs> My first book, published book, or my first book? Because, like, I, when I was five years old, I put together something about my best friend, but that didn't get published. <laughs> I got my first contract in 1992, and that was for a company called uh, Barber, and they were doing a series of Heart Song Presents, and those books were uh, two historical, two contemporary, kind of harlequin-sized books that came out every month. Eventually, I managed that entire line from acquisitions to typeset. My husband worked with me on that, our mm -hmm. daughter, and a friend from church. And it really yeah. taught me a lot about both sides of the fence, believe me. I had a deeper appreciation for my editors after doing that. Yeah. I got my first book contract in 2008. So um, I guess that, wow, 10 years ago. I didn't even think about that. 10 years this year, and I'm on book 18. So it's, it's been a lot of work. But oh. um, it's a lot of fun. It Love is. Love it. So what was your question? Well, I know she had another oh. part of the question, Actually, yeah. Actually, my question is the same. Mirrors hers. It okay. It's about your process of collaboration. Do you want to tell her or do you want me to? Sure. <laughs> 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 I love co-writes because it helps to bring in other authors to your publisher and introduce to your audience. Mm -hmm. Judith Pella did that for me, and it was an amazing gift because I wanted to write for Bethany House as well as Barbara. And Bethany House w was really the name and continues to be the name in historical fiction. And so Judith Pella, I met her at a uh, writer's conference and just brazenly asked her if she would ever consider co-writing with me, and it worked out. We talked about our stories and, and whatnot. I have co-written with James Scott Bell and Judith Miller. Judith's a dear friend. Jim, Jim became a good friend. Uh, and, and Kim, of course, I even co-wrote one long ago with my daughter. But the process is different for everybody that co-writes, I'm sure. For me, what we do is we get together and we think about, you know, usually we'll be talking and we'll come up with an idea that we think sounds like great fun. Yeah. And we say, hey, let's, let's try to develop this into a book. Yeah. And so we start working on the ideas. We send it back and forth and develop what we call our chapter-by-chapter -chapter synopsis. We are plotters. We plot everything out. Mm -hmm. There are writers who call themselves seat of the pantsers. I just think they're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we plot everything out in detail. And mm -hmm. both of us are very fast writers. 
for the first draft. We get that down just fast and furious. And uh, what she, she's doing the bulk of the work on this series. So she has to have most of the research done. I have to have a good working knowledge of it. Because she writes the first draft, sends it to me, I add on to it, or send it back to her. And she, you know, finishes developing it. It'll go that way if we need it several times. And then it, it gets turned into the publisher. But she also co-wrote with her daughter, and it was entirely different. Yeah, um, <coughs> with my daughter, I wrote the adult POVs, and I wrote in third person <coughs> past, which is probably the most normal, you know, what people think about when you read. And my daughter wrote all of the young teen POVs, and she wrote in first person, which, you know, was not done a whole lot at that time, and I thought, is this even going to be acceptable? But people have loved it, and they've loved reading it because they knew who was who and what was happening. And um, the first book that we wrote together, her character has the same nerve disorder that my daughter has. So it was really authentic because the mother-daughter relationship was very real coming through, you know, out on the page. It was very distinct who wrote what, and she's a brilliant writer. Um, when Tracy and I write together, it's amazing. Nobody can, dis can distinguish between who wrote what, which I think is really pretty cool, you know, that they're able to see that it just flows. And so what really was your great. second question? It, it was actually exactly what you're mm -hmm. Okay, you good, good, good. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? <laughs> yeah. All right. Not my daughter. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Um, and see, normally it seems like Kayla is the one who gets the most attention. Um, she is 20, and um, she'll be. She's about to be 21 in March, and she's about to graduate with her English literature degree from the University of Colorado with a 4.0. She's brilliant, and she's about to start grad school after that. What Kim doesn't um, tell you is they were first famous. Yeah. As an extreme home makeover family. Yeah. We had a bowling alley in our basement, if you ever watched that show. <laughs> um, but they chose us because of Kayla's yeah. condition, and more than 10,000 people around the country had nominated us, um, and we didn't know. I had never even seen the show when they first contacted, so it was a beautiful thing. But she doesn't sweat and she doesn't feel pain, and so it's really rare, and we have to keep her in a controlled environment all the time. But as you saw, she's beautiful and brilliant and, you know, overcoming joy. So she's been all over there TV. Some people will even at the book signings will say, I, I knew I saw you yeah. before. <laughs> she's been on Montel and uh, Mystery ER yeah. and of course the, the Extreme Home Makeover. So. Yeah. yeah. You had a question back there? Yeah. Oh, no, oh I, I thought you were going to ask. Yes. Oh, it clicked. <laughs> yes. I do. <laughs> I do. I do have a love for Alaska. I've got friends up there. Uh, one of my very best friends from childhood moved up there when we were 13 because her father was in the Air Force. And so I've always loved Alaska and learned as much as I could because of that relationship. Uh, I've been there many, many times and would happily probably move there, but I don't think my kids would like that. Yeah. Uh, but I do. I love it. It's just a gorgeous state and uh, a lot of really incredible people. And I live in Montana, which is like Alaska, but smaller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. and Kim actually lived there for a while. Mm -hmm. she, they were yeah. missionaries, so you can tell yeah. that. We love Alaska. So, um, in fact, when we first really were working together in the writing sense, we were on the mission field in Alaska, and her husband, Jim, was also an editor at the time, and he was helping me, and he knew the plane, the 1937 World War II Grumman Goose that actually flew to our island. There's only three in the world <laughs> that are functioning. And <laughs> there's a fourth that's in the Smithsonian that's in better condition than the one that we flew to our island. Um, but they actually don't work anymore. They just built an airport. But it was so fascinating because he knew all about the plane. I was like, how did you know this? But he's a historian, and so we just had the connection. And I think that started drawing us closer, too, was Absolutely. Alaska. So, yes, a lot of love for Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's Alaska why we left still Alaska. very much the frontier. Yep. There's a lack of a lot of things up there, mm -hmm. yep. even today. Yeah. It's still a lot <coughs> bigger now than it was, but we actually had to leave Alaska because our daughter had to have brain surgery because Alaska was the best place for her since she doesn't sweat. Sure. 
and we're from the south, you know, it'll kill her down here. And um, so we moved from south, south, south Louisiana. I mean, we were from communities where if you lived north of I-10, you were Yankees, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're down there in the sticks, you know? That's where we were from. And both of our kids were born down there. And, you know, we moved to Alaska to give her a better life. And, but we actually had to leave because she had to have brain surgery. So it's very true. I mean, there's great doctors up there, but she's so rare, it was hard to have anything done. And how many years ago was that? That was a long time she ago. She had brain surgery 11 years ago. And it, you know, Alaska is changing all the time, of course. But yep. still, there is more of Alaska that's unsettled and untouched than settled, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would. Yep. Especially if you live in a place like Skagway, Ketchikan, you know, like when we mm -hmm. lived on on Accutan, you know, there was a nurse's clinic, but that was it, you know, a native village of 80 people and us, you know, um, there, there wasn't anything there and you had to be life flighted out if anything major happened. And most of the time, helicopters and airplanes couldn't land because the wind was so bad and the weather so bad. So it's, it's a tough place to live if you're remote in Alaska. <laughs> a friend put our name in for this mission in Alaska because he'd heard about Kayla. And five months later, we lived in Alaska with no Walmart and no cars and no roads. <laughs> and, and no, no nothing. <laughs> no library. There wasn't anything. There wasn't a lick of anything on the so island. So now we want so. to gift you. We want to have, have a lovely you know, prize. We're going to give to one person. Wait, hold on, hold on. We have to tell what's in it. If I'm talented and enough to do it. And I don't think we it. can use the purse thing because we've got gentlemen here that don't oh, have yeah. purses. Oh, yeah. So this hardcover, the series that came out last year of Tracy's Amy. I'm going to need hands because I'm obviously not talented enough. That's the heart of the uh, Frontier series I told you about that was set at the <laughs> mission. And <laughs> then there's a hymn CD of mine. Because Kim is a classically trained musician who sings beautifully. And this next book of mine, which isn't even out yet, it comes out February 1st, The Mayflower Bride. So whoever wins this. It's the beginning of that you're series. You're on the cutting edge. <laughs> and then this book, our first book together, All Things Hidden. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want you to buy the other two books that are here today. Support your library, support the bookstore that's here. And a cute little bag that has Out of the Ashes on it. Okay, so we have to come up and with we'll something different. And we'll happily sign the books for you. Yes, we'd love to sign books. And while so. she figures out how she's going to do this, I do want to encourage you to buy books from the wonderful man at the back of the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we love to work with the libraries, and we love to work with your local bookstores. Book yeah. And I don't know if the libraries get a pros uh, you know, proceeds from this or not, but I just encourage you to support yeah. them because they were wonderful enough to give us the mm -hmm. time. Yes, please support your library as much as you can. We yes. love libraries. Um, I had a lady ask me at one book sign, she goes, well, you know, I can't believe you came to a library because you're not making any money off of yes. this. And I said, you don't understand. Our readers are at libraries. Mm -hmm. And That's right. we're not worried about the money. We, we are not in this to make money. We wouldn't be writers <laughs> if we were in it for the money. <laughs> we like sharing stories with you. So please support your library yes. um, as much as you can. Please support your local bookstores. Um, so, I would like to know who drove the farthest to get here. Who drove a ways? Anybody drive a ways to get here? No. I drove wow. <laughs> okay. okay. I got to come up with something else. Come okay. on, Trace. Mm. Let's mm. see. Closest birthday to, to today. Do they have birthday today? Anybody have a birthday close to anybody in January? <gasps> you right are there. January you birthday. win. You win. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for having Happy us. Happy birthday. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming.